St. Matthew's here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I'm so grateful to be joined by Bishop Mark Rahim, who has been the bishop, the, the eighth bishop of the diocese, and this is a, your 12th year. I just think. started. Just started the 12th year. When did it start? 4th of September. Ah, so really a new year has been It's a new year. I'm into my dozenth year. Nice. I told him I thought we should have brought donuts. <laughs> a dozen and donuts that go together, but I'll ask to get this started talking today. Um, what I wanted to just kind of take advantage of you uh, being here today to do is talk about what it's like for you. What has been, so you've been a bishop for almost in your 12th year, but how long have you been ordained to priesthood? Wow, um, I should guess I should know that off the top of my head. So I think I've been a priest for, I'm in my 24th year of being ordained. Goodness. Yeah. And that doesn't include the time you were a deacon, right? That would include the time oh, I was yeah. deacon. Yeah, I used, the, I used my ordination to the diaconate sort of as my, when I was first ordained. So as it fits. Um, in liturgy, even as a priest and then a deacon, priest and bishop, are there moments that stick out for you? You know, I it, it, this is really interesting. Um, good question. One of the things that I that a, a habit that I, I started along with many other people in seminary. So this is revealing a little something. Um, is the daily office. Right, saying morning prayer at least, and then when I'm really on my game, morning and evening prayer, <clears throat> uh, and that because I have to say that while we focus so much energy on the Eucharist, um, you talk to a lot. I've discovered even talking to bishop friends, uh, so many folks sort of will point to the fact that the daily office has been the thing that really has sustained them and really has connected them and uh, is such an important part of, of their life, um, their spiritual life. Uh, I love, I mean, one of my favorite things in the liturgy um, would be uh, just the, the Venite, come let us sing unto the Lord, let us shout, for joy to the rock of our salvation. Um, you know, we, we don't get a lot of, um, we, we Episcopalians sometimes uh, kind of shy away from um, being people who quote scripture. But the more you know your prayer book, actually, the more you know a lot of scripture. So the Vanity is one that I really, I love the Vanity. Um, I love the, um, uh, the Song of Simeon, Lord. Now you've set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised, for my eyes have seen the Savior. Uh, I find myself saying the Nunc Dimittis uh, uh, almost reflect, reflexively as the jet is starting to zoom down the runway for takeoff. It's, it's just sort of, a, it's sort of part of who I am. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the general thanksgiving that concludes morning prayer is such a wonderful wonderful prayer. Um, and those are things that have come to me over daily practice. Um, now, in the Eucharist, of course, there are certain things that, that I, I, I do love. Um, I, you know, and it's funny, uh, one of my favorite pieces of the Eucharist is the go in peace to love and serve the Lord, the sense that we have received this wonderful, we've been nourished and um, we are now being sent out to go and uh, to serve and to seek and to, uh, to see Christ in all people, to, to put it all into, into action. Um, and so it just it strikes me funny that so much of the uh, worry and the concern and the emphasis of our church um, in my experience as a bishop is focused on this on, on, on what we do Sunday morning and, and how you know we're not being the church if we don't have Holy Communion right to at 
11 o'clock on Sunday morning, that, that somehow um, there's something innately wrong with us. Um, and, and I know I don't, I mean, that, that, and, and that, then, that then translates into how do we get more clergy, right? Meanwhile, the people in the pews are thinking, how do we get more people in the pews? And, um, and the solution, the default solution in our institutional mind is uh, those two things are connected. If we only had more clergy, we'd have more people in the pews. If we only had more people in the pews, we'd have more clergy. Um, and for me, and I, and I think when I became bishop, I think, I, I think that's a, you know, that, that those are questions that need to be addressed. I mean, I've given a lot of energy uh, and thought to that. But in recent years, particularly here in Alaska, I've realized that the quality of our church really is measured by the spiritual life and the commitment and the faithfulness of our people as lay leaders. I mean, we are all called to be leaders in this church. We're all called to be ministers in this church. And that any community, when two or three are gathered, Christ is in the midst of them. And they have everything they need, right? We, we tend to, though, slip into, again, because we're an institutional church, we tend to slip into this mindset uh, that we're lacking something. And sometimes I think we slip into this mindset where the church becomes a commodity that we should be receiving. You know, that, that um, I, I don't want to be a minister. I want to come to church. I want to do my hour and a half and get a, you know, get a, get a good sermon and, and, and get a, 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 a wafer and a sip of wine and say my prayers and hear the music and then go on my, 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 my own way. Um, but that's the gift of the Book of Common Prayer for us, isn't it? It is, right, exactly. Because we can do this anywhere. We can do this anywhere and with, any, with anyone. I mean, we really can be a house church, um, you know, which is the original, it's, it's the OG, you know what I mean? It's the original, it's the original model, um, is house church, faithful people coming together uh, to worship and to pray and then to, uh, and then to figure out how they can express the gospel um, in their community, how they can make it come alive. Um, and I think that's kind of my, I mean, I, I, I guess I see that as the vision um, that, I, that I'm striving for. I've been, you know, we're trying now, I think is, uh, we're, we're focusing more and more, um, or at least I'm hoping to focus more and more on this idea of community discernment. You know, if you say discernment to folks in church, I would guess that most people would make the association that discernment is something you do for somebody who is looking to get ordained. I think that's true. I want to change that, or I want to expand that. Because discernment really is what we all should, we're all about. You know, a community in discernment doesn't look to just one person to be set apart, um, but in fact looks at everyone and says, here are the gifts, you know, here are the treasures that we have, here are the ministers that God has given us um, with empowered with the Spirit's gifts. Now let's see how we can bring that all together and make the gospel alive and make the community's spiritual life grow, um, and all of us taking responsibility for that. And that, to me, is a church I want to be part of. It sounds like that's sort of an expansion of who you have been as a deacon, priest, and bishop. Yeah. I'm curious, it's one of the things I've been curious about, is how has your vision for this diocese changed over, now you're in the second decade of that. Has your dream for this diocese changed in such a way that it becomes more um, one that focuses on, on a common call? Ah, um, you know, Betty, I, I, uh, I, I again, I, I came to Alaska 
before I even had any thoughts, you know, well, I don't think I ever had any thoughts of being a bishop, but um, I, I came to Alaska on a sabbatical uh, in 2006, and what brought me here for that sabbatical was I was interested in how uh, my own love of flying and my own uh, pilot's license um, might allow me to become involved or connect with uh, ministry that's happening in in um, ur ur rural areas where you know uh, it's harder to connect, um, hoping that I would find just that sort of idea, that sort of vision that that um, that I just talked about. That you know, uh, believing that there we would find sort of the model of the church, the early church. You know, the model of the organic home uh, house church uh, sort of model. Um, and so that was the first uh, that was the first trip here, and and I found that um, I, I did I did I found the church existing in pretty uh, challenging circumstances vis-a-vis um, -vis places I was aware of back in, in the lower forty eight, um, but saw so many ways that it could be developed. I mean, many places were still sort of so glad that the guy with the white collar had flown in, so that now we could have church. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I, I experienced when I first came to Alaska is recognizing that you know the, this this is a diocese um, where there are giants shoulders that we stand upon um, and uh, and and legends right this is a diocese of legends names like you know um, Peter Trimble Rowe and Hudson Stuck and and Bill Gordon I mean you know the the giants. And um, and in some ways, you know, it's hard to stand in those shadows. But I think there's also, um, I think there's also sort of a, a part of our diocesan experience that we're always looking for those heroes or those champions, you know, um, larger than life. Um, and in some ways, that that can make us not see the real champions uh, that are in our midst, you know, the, the, the people who have been uh, faithful um, and uh, extraordinary ministers um, whose pictures or names may never show up on a, uh, on a wall. Um, may never wear a white collar. May never wear, and, and probably won't ever wear a white collar, and, and, and that's right. Um, it reminds me of folks <clears throat> that I've met in Husnia who are wonderful lay leaders, mm -hmm. great um, enthusiasm and commitment to the church. Yeah, and those, and, and, and I have the wonderful blessing of being able to go around to uh, all the parishes and all the communities and seeing those people mm -hmm. and, and getting to know those people um, and celebrating with them. Um, they are the, they, they, they are my hope. And so is. So I move into these later years of my episcopate here. Um, I, I, I do want us to work more and more on focusing. It would be sort of changing the language of discernment into something that uh, ultimately helps us to see those gifts in the individuals in our community and then to find a way uh, to support them and to raise them up and to uh, empower them and to honor them. You know, the, the collar, of course, a uh, person walks into a room with a collar on, they're already, by default, given a sense of authority or presence, um, <laughs> even if it's perhaps not earned. Um, uh, and I say that very, very broadly speaking. Um, I hope folks can understand what I'm saying. But then there's the quiet person whose authority sometimes isn't recognized because you know because they're, they they don't have that status, and so I I want us to sort of be able to raise up folks, offer them the training, the resources, the gifts that they feel they need um, to be more effective or more uh, present in their ministries, um, and then and then to celebrate them. Yeah. Um, as we get ready to close this episode of our conversations off, is there anything that you would want to offer the folks who are 
looking at this to, so that they can also touch the dreams that God may have for them. Yeah, well, I just would want to remind everyone that um, the ministers of the gospel are all of us and that I am just so, uh, just so deeply grateful. I, I was reflecting on my, on the anniversary of my ordination this past weekend and um, really was thinking it's not, it, it's not really in any way, shape or form even about me. It's really about this diocese and how grateful I am for the people here and for the people who have been just such wonderful ministers to me and the people who have been such uh, so faithful in their in their own community in prayer and worship and in and and in proclaiming um, the love and the presence of of Jesus in in the spirit and sometimes you know that really does bring to life the two or three are gathered so I would just want to you know say to you thank you and to recognize that the Spirit is empowering you and giving you the gifts um, and that uh, you have a holy and a blessed ministry to offer this church and to keep doing that. Um, keep the faith, as our presiding bishop would say, um, but also to um, go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you again. Hope that you will check out our the St. Matthews page on YouTube, and you can access all of our videos. They, we will continue doing them. If you hit subscribe and then the bell button, you'll get notified whenever we post a new video. I'd also like to offer that if you have any questions that are burning that you would like to have the bishop address, please send them along to us. You can either email us through our website, you can send us a message on Facebook Messenger, or you could call us on the telephone, and we would be happy to talk to you. But we're always looking for ideas and would welcome your suggestions. God bless you. See you soon.